Amen. Okay, so here we are in Romans chapter 10. Just keep your place there. So Romans chapter 10 is a continuation, once again, of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, kind of Paul is talking about the same uh, overall theme. He's talking about, you know, the Jews and his, his heart towards, you know, the Israelites, his, his nation. He's kind of making an appeal um, for them um, that they would be saved. So it, you know, he really gets into the, the nuts and bolts of it in Romans chapter 11, and he kind of finishes up this thought. So I'm not going to dig too deep into that um, part of Romans chapter 10 tonight, but if you look down at verse number 1 in Romans chapter 10, the Bible reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So once again, he's appealing you know, towards Israel. He's appealing that they would be saved because they're not. And they're not, you know, this, this just kind of goes to show you, you know, the, the overall state of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel was, you know, a religious um, nation. You know, it was, a, it was a religion. And it goes to show you that it's kind of a proof that the mainstream of the Jews did not accept Christ. Okay, the mainstream religious leaders of that time of the Jews did not accept Christ. Now, that should, you know, could be, you could apply that today that, you know, we should, you know, take that as a little bit of a warning on whatever the mainstream of the religion is in the country, is that maybe we should raise an eyebrow towards that and make sure that, you know, um, what they're saying is what the Bible's saying and match that up. And I mean, obviously what mainstream Christianity says today is not even close to what the Bible says. So Paul's having a, a problem here with his nation it, that's very similar to the nation that we have today and the religion of our nation as well. So in verse number two, he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Turn to Acts chapter 17. So he says that they have the, this zeal and it's not according to knowledge. Now this is, this is people who we could, we could compare this to people who are followers of you know, false teachings today, or followers of, you know, false prophets today. Now, I believe that false prophets are, are wicked people, and, you know, they're, they're, they're reprobates in, in most cases, I would say, and, but the, you'll find that most, that are, there's a lot of followers out there who are just, they're just without knowledge. They just don't know that it's not true, and they're, you'll, you'll see this when you go out soul winning, if you ever confront, uh, a false prophet of some kind, like a Jehovah's Witness or some other weird uh, false religion, you'll often find that there's one main um, leader in the pair or in the group, and the other person or the other you know people in that group are just they're just following. You can tell, you know. I mean, I've been in many situations. One time in the Philippines, we confronted these false prophets who were going around in the same area that we were. And so we just confronted them to try to get them out of there. It's really easy to confront false prophets, by the way, because you'll find that none of them know anything about the Bible. So they're just, they're just making up a bunch of garbage. And when you show them the Bible, they have nothing to say. So I, I ended up confronting this, this one you know, pair, these two young men. One of them was in his 20s, and the other one must have been you know, 17 or 18. And I could tell that when I was rebuking the, the older, the main one, I could tell that the other, you know, the guy that was with him was kind of like, so I focused in on him and I said, you know, here, this kid, just think about this kid. He's following this guy around. He has zeal. He wants to do what's right. He wants to serve God with his life. He wants to do, you know, he has this desire to serve, in his, but it's not according to knowledge. He, he didn't know what he was doing. You know, you could kind of see the fear in his eyes when I was quoting the Bible and talking about the things that were wrong with what they were teaching. And he was like, he was listening to what I was saying. And I finally, at the end of the conversation, I just told that kid, I said, you better get away from this guy or you're going to burn in hell. And, you know, I believe that you can get to those, those people who are, you know, full of zeal but without knowledge. Those are the people that we need to pull out of the fire, as the Bible says. Okay, so that's what he's talking about. He's talking about there's a lot of Jews. I don't believe he's talking about the Jewish leaders here. Many of the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, you know, Jesus knew that they were reprobate. reprobate. They, they could not believe, Jesus said about many of the Pharisees. Okay, so these are the ones sitting in the false churches. These are the ones, you know, ignorantly following um, false religion that we need to get to. We need to preach the gospel to them. Look at Acts um, chapter 17. Look, 
the Bible teaches that you shouldn't just listen to what people tell you. Okay? Look at Acts chapter 17. Look at verse number 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they received what Paul was saying with all readiness of mind, but they were also searching the scriptures daily just to make sure that they were so. That's what you should be doing, by the way. You shouldn't just be listening to preaching, even from me. Look, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you to not just listen to whatever I tell you from this pulpit. I'm telling you to read your Bible and to understand what the Scripture says. Because then these, if everybody did what I'm telling you to do, there, wouldn't, there would be no false churches. If everybody had a King James Bible, was saved, and was searching the Scriptures daily, there would be no false prophets claiming to be Christian pastors. Because they would be thrown out of whatever. Or everyone would leave their church and go to a church where there, you know, the guy was preaching what was right out of the Bible. Okay, so you know, uh, a friend of mine in North Dakota that I went to church with at, at the church I went to up there, it was an old IFB church, but he would always say, he's like, these people are just a bunch of bobbleheads. Because you know, he, he would say that this pastor could say anything that he wanted from the pulpit and everyone would just be like, uh, uh-huh. He's like, they're just a bunch of bobbleheads. He's like, he could preach works-based salvation, he could preach anything, and these people would just nod and just bobblehead away. So don't be a bobblehead. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Search the scriptures and find out what the Bible says. It's, look, it's your personal responsibility. Okay? It's your personal responsibility. Look at Romans 10, chapter, or, uh, verse number 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of of God. Now, remember back in Romans 9, in verse number 31, the Bible said, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Look, they, they were following after the law of righteousness, and they couldn't attain to it. Because look, you can't, there, there is none righteous. You can't be good enough, is what the Bible teaches. Wherefore? Why? Because they sought it not by faith. The law of faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. Now look, I don't know how, I mean, Romans is so clear on, on salvation. It's, it's unbelievable that people could even misunderstand salvation unless they were almost trying to. But look, I want you to focus back on verse number three, where the Bible says they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now look, let me just say something. There is a difference between, because people twist this today and teach false doctrine, there's a difference between submitting yourself to Christ and submitting unto the righteousness of God. It's different. Those are two completely different things. Do you see how words are important in the Bible? Do you see how maybe you should have a King James Bible in, in your hand? There is a difference. Submission, turn to Matthew chapter 7. Submission to God's righteousness is the reason that most people won't be saved. That's the reason. I will often say to people out soul winning, I will say, now, you know, after they understand hell and after they understand, you know, they're, they're a sinner and they deserve hell, I will often say to them, now, do you think that most people are going to heaven? I mean, I don't know why I ask that. I just like to hear the answer from people. Because some people think that, because liberal Christianity today is teaching all these people that most people go to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And that most people are going to get there. And that it's pretty much just everybody's going to go. Because God's not a meanie head that would send people to hell. So, Turn to Luke, uh, Matthew chapter 7. Let me read for you Luke chapter 13. The funny thing is the disciples actually asked Jesus this question. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? You go to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read you this parallel passage. And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Straight. S-T-R-A-I-T. Meaning narrow. 
like the Straits of Hormuz. It's a narrow passageway. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Matthew 7, verse 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be with go, that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way. He doesn't say hard is the way. He doesn't say difficult is the way. Another importance of words, individual words in the King James Bible, he says narrow is the way. And few there be that find it. So there will be few that go to heaven compared to those that go to hell. Unfortunately. Look, so it's a free gift. So why are only a few going to get it? I mean, that's a good question. And that's a, that's a question that you should make sure that you answer completely for people when you're out soul winning. It's, it's because of this. Because it takes submission to God's righteousness. That's why. That's why there will be few that get it. Because you know what doesn't take you know, total submission to God's righteousness? It doesn't take total submission to God's righteousness to believe that I had this moment and I turn from my sins to be saved. That does not take total submission to God's righteousness to think that. It is not submission to God's righteousness to believe that I have this walk with Jesus that gets me to heaven. That is not total submission to God's righteousness. It's not. It's not submission to God's righteousness to believe that because I'm this great Christian, that because I keep asking God for forgiveness, because I'm repenting of my sins daily, whatever that even means, because I confess my sins. I used to believe that one on a weekly or daily basis, or just being a pi pious person that I'll make it. Look, Kanye West, I got to address it. Here's what, first of all, Kanye West, let me just, let's look at if this is submission to God's righteousness. Let me just give you a quote. I'm going to read you a quote because guess what? You're not going to find a statement of faith from Kanye West. You won't find it. I looked. You won't find it. Kanye West, quote, now the trend, the shift is going to change. Jesus has won the victory. I told you about my arrogance and cockiness already. Now, the greatest artist that God has ever created is now working for him. Thank you for the opportunity to have given me a platform that, that, that is so vast that no one can take it away once I've turned everything over to you. <laughs> Look, that's not... That's not I, I did find the statement of faith of his pastor, by the way. The one that he got saved from. It's not total submission to God's righteousness to believe that you're part of God's chosen elect. Amen. That is not submission to God's righteousness. It is not submission to God's righteousness to believe that you have given your life to Jesus Amen. to be saved. Amen. Right. Give your life to Jesus to be saved. Whoa! That's exactly backwards! Yep. God doesn't need anything from you. Amen. Amen. I mean, Paul said, you know, that as though he needed anything from you. God doesn't need anything from you. As, look, God's the one that did the giving. Not you. I gave my life to, to Jesus. What a bunch of garbage. I mean, it's, it's exactly backwards. Look, it's all works-based salvation. It's still all about you, Kanye. That's what it's about. Look, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure this one out, guys and gals. Look, he's in the news constantly. I mean, his Google search analytics in the last few months have like gone up by like 400%. And guess who, you know, he's hanging out with who? He's hanging out with Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen's like, what? This pop culture guy? He, he's like, he said Jesus? Get him in here. 
Get him in here. That's what he's doing. He's like, I'm going to write a book about this. I'm not, it's, I'm not kidding at all. That's exactly what's happening. These guys are marketing geniuses. They know how to make money. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there with zeal and no knowledge at all. None. I mean, it's crazy. You get up there and you say a bunch of stupid garbage that means nothing. You believe nothing except in yourself. And you say Jesus four times in, you know, 20 minutes and everyone's like, Look at all the people that Kanye is leading to Jesus. I mean, I mean, it's it's it makes me literally sick. I mean, all right, where are we at? Look, Joel, Joel, look, look, Joel Osteen knows what he's doing. I mean, he, he's, he, may be, he may be a false prophet who's going to burn in hell, yep, but he's not, a, he's not an idiot as far as how to make money. Yeah. I mean, he knows how to do that. He, he's, the, he's the white, non-hip-hop version of Kanye. Yep. That's what he is. That's right. I mean, he's maybe a little bit even more polished, a little bit better of a salesman. Maybe not. It's, it's debatable on which one's better yeah. as a salesman. It, look, that's, that's why you won't find a statement of faith, faith, by the way. Because statements of faith, they, 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 they tell people where you stand and it excludes people. It offends people. You know, when you say, hey, I believe the Bible, there's a lot of offensive things in the Bible. I don't just believe, you know, the nice things about the Bible. I believe all the wrath and I believe all the, you know, the judgment in the Bible. I believe all of it. Well, you know what? That offends a lot of people. But here's one big indicator on both of those people, especially Kanye West. Where's the gospel in his speech? Where is it? You won't find it. His speech is all about, oh, I've done this, and I've done that, and I no longer do this, and I have figured all these things out now, and I know what's best for the American family, and I this, and I that. It's all about him. It's no different. He's just got a different niche now. And he's just whipping off a whole new bunch of people. Look. Matthew 19. Go to Matthew 19. It's not submission to God's righteousness. It takes, it takes a humble person to submit to God's righteousness. It takes humility. That's why, that's why you'll go to nicer neighborhoods and like fewer people are going to get saved all the time. It doesn't mean that people can't get saved, but you're going to see a noticeable trend that the nicer neighborhood you go into, the more you know, affluent people are, you know, the more money people have, the more comfortable they are on this earth and this life, it's harder for them to get saved because they believe in themselves. And they don't want to submit to God's righteousness. They think they have it figured out. And it takes a humble person to say, you know what? It's none of me. Amen. And I, I mean, I deserve the worst, and I can do nothing for myself to get myself out of this. It's all Christ. Amen. And it has nothing to do with me. Let's look at the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. Look at verse number 16. And behold, one came unto him and said, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not lie. He said, Honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. He just lies to Jesus' face. Imagine that. Imagine just standing in front of the Lord and just lying to his face. I believe that Jesus was upset with this young man at this point. He just lied to his face. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, 
and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Look, then Jesus says unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man hardly enter into, a kingdom, into the kingdom of heaven. For his harder, for, again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, he makes an example of this kid. And he's like, look, that's why it's so hard for rich people to go to heaven. Because this kid came and he lied to my face and he told me he was perfect and he's so puffed up and proud that he thought he did nothing wrong in his life. That he committed no sin. I mean, crazy. Look, it takes a humble person to realize that you could never do anything to, to, to get saved or to stay saved. Period. It takes a humble person to realize that your debt was paid by somebody else. You know, it takes a humble person to realize, you know, that you have to submit to God's righteousness and not your own. What submission to God's righteousness is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it is. That's submitting to God's righteousness and not your own. All right, verse number 4. Romans 10, verse number 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to, any, to everyone that believeth. Now, does that say that Christ is the end of the law? No, it says Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, right. not the end of the law. For Moses describe, describeth the righteousness with it of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. Yeah, you can, you can have righteousness of the law if you keep it all. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So like I've said before, there's two ways to heaven. Keep the whole law, or believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And good luck keeping the whole law. You've already failed. That's right. So there's only one way. So the righteousness of the law, he's saying here, is our own righteousness. Verse number 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now verse 6 and verse 7 are a little confusing. I want to explain those to you. But the righteousness which is of faith, not the righteousness of the law, see the difference? Speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? And then in parentheses it says, that is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Look, Paul's talking about the Jews and his, his sorrow for the Jews here. And what he's trying to get you to understand is that the Jews didn't believe that Christ died and descended into the deep, by the way, into hell. That's a great verse for Jesus went to hell. Or they, they didn't believe that Jesus died and rose again. Or they didn't believe he ascended into heaven either. That's what he's saying here. Okay, the Jews didn't believe that. And we could go into this long treatise about how you know, the Jews were living, you know, looking for an earthly king that was going to restore their kingdom. But no, basically what Paul is saying here, he's not saying all that. He's just saying that they, don't, they didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's why they're not saved, like he said in verse number 1, at the beginning of the chapter. Look at verse number 8. But, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. No, this is just uh, quoting um, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 14. Um, where the Bible, I'll just read it for you. The word, but the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart. Thou may, mayest do it. You know, just going to show that Moses, Abraham, David, all saved, saved by the same word, all saved the same way. There's no dispensations. They're all saved by the law of faith. Amen. It's all the same throughout the Bible. Look at verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich 
unto all that call upon him. For again, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's talking about people who believe in their heart and call upon the name of the Lord. Now look, now this debate, I'm not even going to really get into this, but this debate on whether or not you need to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved is a stupid one. Okay, don't get wrapped up in that debate. It's a stupid debate. As if a person who's drowning needs to be told to call for help to, for someone to save them from drowning. It's a dumb debate. If you hear people, oh, do you think, uh, do you have to call upon the name of the Lord or just believe on the Lord? I mean, uh, that's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just, there's never been a person who's drowning in the history of the world who did not call for someone to help yeah. get them, right? If they, you know, they knew they were drowning. So if you know that you're not saved and someone teaches you how to preach the gospel to you, you know, and says, you know, you just have to ask God to, you know, to save you. And you're like, no, I'm not going to ask. You didn't get it. You, know, you didn't get the message. You, know, you didn't get the memo. You missed it somewhere. Okay. Look at verse number 14. How shall they call on him? Now this is a, verse number 14 and, and 15. I just love these two verses. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now Paul, this just goes to show you how beautiful the writing of Paul and the Holy Spirit is together. Because Paul just could have said here, if I was writing this, I, and, and you know, the Holy Spirit said, okay, here's the message I want you to get across, here's what I would have said. Go soul winning. But it's so much better how he wrote it here. He's like, how are people going to know unless someone goes and tells them? You know, so the path to someone getting saved is this. A preacher is sent. He says, people hear the Word of God. They hear the Gospel from that preacher who is sent. They believe the Gospel after they've heard it. And then they call upon the Lord for salvation. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. So the question is this. I mean, who's going to go out and tell these people? Who's going to go out and preach the Gospel? How are they going to hear, is the question. Ezekiel 33, look down at verse number 6. <clears throat> we, see, we see soul winning described in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 33 and verse number 6, the Bible says, But if the watchmen see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. I mean, that's a powerful verse right there. Look, if you believe on Christ, if you are saved, you know the sword is coming. You know. And everybody here knows. It, I mean... You know that everybody in this world, the vast majority of people in this world, are walking towards a cliff. You know. You know that hell is real. Guy at Verity puts it this way. He's like, you know, we go soul winning because, you know, it's not a plastic hell. It's real. It's a real hell. And you see these people out there, the vast majority of whom are not saved, who don't believe, the vast majority of whom are not reprobate, rejects, haters of God, the vast majority of you who just need to know the truth. And the Bible says that if you don't go soul winning, you have their blood on your hands. That's what the Bible says. Look, here's the beautiful thing about soul winning. There's many jobs. Like, there's, there's a job at work where I have a, if I have a cabinet that's got 500 wires in it, that need to be landed at all these different places, I can't put five people in that cabinet because only one man can fit in that cabinet. Here's the nice thing about soul winning. Soul winning is literally a linear function of man hours. Meaning, the more people you put on the job and the more hours you put into it, the more people that will get saved. There's not a situation where you're like, oh yeah, I just can't put two people soul winning today because there's not enough room. No, 
the more people that go soul winning in this world, the more people that will end up in heaven. It's that simple. It, it's, it's, a, it's a direct correlation. It's a function of man hours, period. You know, F to the X. That, that's what it is. And the Bible says that if you don't go and you, and you know the sword is coming, every person that is truly saved knows the sword is coming. And most people who are saved will never go soul winning. It's pitiful. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have blood on your hands. That's what the Bible says. You say, I, I don't, I'm, I'm here and I don't go soul winning. Well, you have blood on your hands. Not me. Bible. Sorry. Welcome to church. <clears throat> Look at verse number 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? Look, this is just him saying that, you know, when you become a soul winner and you go out and you, you preach the word of God, not everyone's going to accept it. Verse number 17. Look, this is why, this is why you know, belief... This is why, I, you know, it's perfect that God made salvation by belief. Because belief is an issue of the heart. And the issue, of, the, the belief in your heart is the only thing that is uniquely yours. Think about that. It's the only thing that's uniquely yours. You have total control of. Nobody else can change. Nobody else can force you to change. Look, I can take Brother Matthew and I can tell him that wall is red and you're going to believe it. And he's like, whatever. And I could, I could beat him and I could torture him and I could, I could come near to killing him. And he may say to me, that wall is red, that wall is red, but I could never make him believe it. See? Your belief... Sorry, Brother Matthew. I'm going to stop using you as an example. And you, or you're going to leave the church. I'm sorry. But you see my point. Your belief, your belief is, is who you are. You know, your belief inside you. Look, works can be faked. You know what I'm saying? I mean, works can be faked. God could have made it by works. It's up to Him. Whatever He wants to do. He could have given us charts and graphs and timelines and things like you have to do these works every so often in order to stay. He could have made those rules. But you know what? It's works can be because you can do something and not believe in what you're doing. That's why God talks about when you give to church, God, you know, God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, he wants you to give with your heart, right? Your works can be fake. I can go to work and just go through the motions and not have my heart in it. That's why it's by belief. You know, I mean, that's, that's why it's so beautiful that it's by belief. Amen. Because it's yours. Nobody can take it from you. Nobody can force it out of you. It's, it's truly who you are is what you believe. You can fake everything. You can be fake to everybody, whatever, but what you believe is who you are. It, it's the core of, of, your, of who you are. That's why it's so beautiful, that it's by belief. So once again, you know, the Bible, what God has designed here, makes perfect sense for us. Look at verse number 19. But I say, oh, I'm sorry, verse number 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Look, if you're a soul winner, you're in the Bible. Because this is talking about you. Amen. If you go to the Philippines and you preach the gospel, your words are traveling to the ends of the, ends of the earth. The, the, the gospel is getting spread to the ends of the world by you, by your mouth, if you're a soul winner. I mean, you're famous. You're in the Bible. It's great. Their sound went into all the earth. The sound of your voice preaching the gospel can go into all the earth. I hope that we have a church of, of hundreds of soul winners one day. Amen. And it will, be, it will be our sound of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ coming out of our mouth, Amen. traveling to all the earth. Imagine that. 
And then, you know, we could say, verse number 18 is talking about our church and the people in our church. But it starts with individuals getting out there and learning how to preach the gospel to the people three blocks from here. Amen. And then we go to all the earth. We grow. We grow into verse 18. We're not verse 18 right now. But we grow into that to the ends of the world. Verse number 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. By a foolish nation I will anger you. But Esaias is very bold and saith, well, turn to Deuteronomy 32, because he's, he's quoting uh, Deuteronomy 32 here. So he's talking again about you know, the Gentiles here. He says, but I say, did Israel not know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. In Deuteronomy 32, let me turn there. The Bible says in verse number 21, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanity, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So, I mean, the Bible is prophesying, you know, the coming in of the Gentiles here. I mean, there's so much prophecy talking about how um, the Gentiles are brought in, you know, with the coming of Christ because, you know, the Jews did not believe. But in, uh, again, in Hosea um, chapter 1 and verse 10, we see another one of these. I'll read that one for you. You can go ahead and turn there. Hosea, right after Daniel, you have the book of Hosea. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Talking about these people who are not God's people becoming, you know, the sons of God. Talking about the Gentiles here. Amen. Look at verse number 20. But Esaias is very bold and says, yes, I, I was found of them that sought me not. I was manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all the day long have I stretched forth my hand, hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That's uh, another reference to Isaiah. Go ahead and go to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, and look at verse number 2. And the Bible reads, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. He says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Once again, he's just talking about, you know, the Gentiles being brought in here because they believed in the righteousness of faith and not the righteousness of the law. So look, folks, I mean, it's just, we're just reading Romans here and just look at how many references to the proper gospel, to proper salvation there is. And just, we're only in, in chapter 10. I mean, it is so... Do you, do you kind of start to understand when you read through Romans and we study through... And, it, and we kinda, I kind of start feeling like I'm repeating myself a little bit. Like I'm preaching a gospel message every single time. Because the gospel is usually somewhere in one of these chapters, somewhere. But do you kinda, are you kind of starting to understand how people that go to hell deserve it? I mean, it's sad... We don't want people to go to hell, but there's none, there, there's none with an excuse. It's so obvious. It is so obvious. Look, they either didn't take, you know, it, it's not unfair is what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's sad, and we don't want to see, especially people that we love on this earth, go to hell, but it is not unfair because it's right here. You know, these people have the, everyone on this earth, as we, we saw in Romans chapter 1, and Romans chapter 2, and Romans chapter 3, they start with the law in their heart. Everyone starts with that. We all start at the same starting line. They all, they all are living in the same creation that everyone else is. They can see God everywhere all around them. I mean... They, they either just didn't take the time to look for the truth 
Number one, or you know they they just didn't they just didn't care to know. Or they either they just straight up rejected the truth. So look, it, it's not the the Bible according to salvation is not this complicated code book. There's plenty of people that are twisting it around. There's plenty of people that are taking a word here and changing the Bible and changing God's words. There's plenty of people who are twisting verses, who are pulling a verse and running with a doctrine. There's plenty of those people. But there's really no excuse for people who want to know the truth. Because the Bible is not complicated. It's, it's just one book we're in so far. You know, that's why one of the main reasons we started in Romans, by the way. You know, we're a, we're a new church. We want to establish, you know, those building blocks. You know, the gospel. So, I mean, I don't even really, you know, I don't feel bad that I'm kind of getting up here and I'm just preaching the gospel to you in 17 different ways, you know, every Thursday night. Because we need to know exactly what we believe and why we believe it, especially if we're going to go out and we're going to explain it to others. We're going to become thorough soul winners, people that go out there and pull people out of the fire and get people saved through the Word of God. We need to know what we're talking about. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. And, and all people need, folks, is a humble desire to, to know this truth. And if they have that humble desire, when you come up to them and you open the Bible and you ask them if they want to know, they, they will say yes and you will be able to tell them. And there's lots of those people here. There's lots of those people here. So look, folks, you know, there's no excuse. Once again, we see out of Romans. There's no excuse for people not knowing the truth. I've said this before. That is the main trend you will see in people in churches like this, in Bible-believing churches like this. Look, how many people are here tonight? I mean, you know how many people were at the Kanye Joel show? I don't even know, but it was probably 10,000 or more. And I mean, there's just a handful of people here tonight. Because there's not that many people that want to know the truth. And once, you know, because the truth, I even said to my wife one time, right before we moved, I was like, man, you know, I'm giving up all these things and, you know, this, this worldly stuff is going to be going away for us. And I, and I said to my wife, I was just like, man, it, it the, you know, the thought crosses into your head. I wish we could, not, you know, unknow the things that we know. But I didn't really mean that, of course. But you see what I'm saying? As far as the worldly things go, sometimes, you know, it would be maybe an easier life if you wouldn't know the truth of the Bible. For sure. But I wouldn't trade it for anything. Amen. Right. You know, I thank God for the Bible. I thank God for the truth of the Bible. My wife and I were just saying the other night, you know what, we wouldn't trade, we wouldn't trade anything for the people other than are in this church right now. Amen. My wife joked with me, she's like, you know what, I hope the church doesn't even grow. Amen. And I was like, all right, settle down. <laughs> But it's just that just the people who are here, you gotta, we have to build the right type of people. You can't just, we're not going to bring in all kinds of worldly, unsaved people from the Kanye show and fill up this church. No. I don't want any of that. We don't want any, any of the money that would bring. We don't want any of that. Because we're, as soon as we open this Bible, they're all going to leave anyway. So look, it's all about the truth of the gospel. It's all about the truth of the Bible. And there's no excuse for people who don't not want to know it because it's not complicated and we're willing to tell them. Amen. And you should be willing to tell them if you're not a soul winner. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you for uh, you know, Paul and just the way he so artistically, you know, with, the, with your help, Lord, put this, these chapters together and just just taught us all these things and continues to teach us all these things. And the, the more times I read it, Lord, the more I learn. And I thank you for the depth of your word. Lord, I ask that you just inspire us and just, just give us that drive to, to win souls, Lord. Give us that drive to go out and preach your word. Give us that heart, Lord. Give us that knowledge that that sword is coming for these people and help us never get desensitized to that. 
out of all the things that we're getting desensitized in this world, Lord, help us never to get desensitized to the fact that all these people are going to go to hell unless somebody reaches them, Lord. Lord, I, I thank you for this church. I thank you for all these people. Um, in your precious name we pray. Amen.